Workplace abuse is intentional. If sexual and physical assault are crimes, it stands to reason that psychological assault should also be a crime. Well, thanks to Vicki Cordomanchi, the co-founder of End Workplace Abuse, the movement to make this happen is growing. I really want to believe that all people, especially parents, but anyone on this universe, that we are appreciative of who, what has been sown into us and we want to be better than our prior generation, maybe even better than our parents. And once we know better, we do better. And I want to believe that we're all, we all want the best for each other. But unfortunately, workplace abuse really shows us that that is not the case. And it literally breaks my heart. What was your experience with abuse in the workplace? What's your backstory? Well, I actually, your story always reminds me of mine because I just mm. got up one morning and started crying and I, I couldn't go back. Um, and I, you know, I mean, I just couldn't take any more. And at the time, I didn't even know what any more was. I really did mm -hmm. not realize that I was being, you know, psychologically manipulated. Um, mm -hmm. And I found that out a day after I left the workplace, I discovered that back level of um, interpersonal abuse from the employer. And that really sent me reeling because I was um, a 20 year employee. I was alumni from the institution. I gave charitably to the institution. I was, you know, my jaw could not have hit the floor harder that people intentionally did this to me. And um, I reeled for a long time. I did not know what to do. It took me, you know, almost two years before I really even had the courage to say to my husband, I think I'm getting better. Um, it was just, uh, you know, such a blow. Yeah. Wow. Do you mind explaining what some of those moments of abuse were. And, you know, I'm, I'm very clear about making sure that we don't trigger people. But I, at least my experience has been, now that I'm four years away from that environment, as you mentioned, it took me about two years before I was finally able to talk about some of the, the unconscionable mm -hmm. actions without crying and without being angry. Do you mind sharing what actually happened? Well, my abuse unfolded over a 15 month period and I was working with my bully for 10 years at that point in time. And I knew the very first day that we worked together that something was off. Um, but, you know, sometimes there were these um, storms, psychosocial storms, and we were just the perfect mix. I was insecure and she came, you know, was throwing her you know, inadequacies at me. And I didn't know enough to recognize the behavior. So I kind of sat, you know, in the second, she was the director, I was the assistant director. And I just sat in that role. And I did everything that she wanted me to do. And she really kept me, she put me in a remote location to work. Um, so that when people came in, they would see her, they wouldn't see me. Um, and I was a lot, you know, like I would come out and work an event or a, a function and then she would, you know, delegate me back to the back, you know, the back office, you know, that kind of behavior to start with. And so 10 years deep, I had a new supervisor and she asked me a question in my performance review and she said, do you think you can do anything better? And I swallowed hard because I you know, knew for 10 years I could do things better. And I, and she said, well, like what? And so I threw out two things to me and she took her glasses down and looked at me and she's like, that's amazing. You know, that's, that, that's, that was a great ideas. And so she implemented them. And what that did was infuriate the bully because our positions had become far more, the bully couldn't keep me under her thumb anymore. I had been put into another position so that, I looked like her peer and she just could not tolerate that. And so she started immediately um, withheld like res the reservation system, um, deleted mm -hmm. files, shared files of mine, records, 10 years of records, deleted them. Um, I'm trying to think what I, um, she would withhold invoices from me. She instructed other people to withhold invoices from me. So all the, and now it's, I immediately go to the supervisor because I think she's on my team. 
And I'm, you know, telling her, okay, this is going on, that's going on. And she acknowledges the behavior. And long story short, she tickled my ears for almost six months that she was going to, you know, she told me multiple times, I'll take care of this. I will speak to her. I will do this. I will do that. And about five months deep, I said, I'm all done with this. And I had been told not to go to HR. Um, and again, as a long-term employee, I had that in the back of my mind, but I was in between a rock and a hard place as an older woman in a niche job. I was like, I don't really have a lot of options here. I'm going to take a chance. And I knew these people in HR. So I, you know, I just had all these things in my mind that I thought would work out the way they were supposed to work out. And I approached HR and they said, oh yeah, sure. There's a complaint process. There's going to be an investigation and um, we'll take it from there. So I took a big, a big, you know, deep breath and I was like, okay, I'm good. that's the beginning. And then it got far worse because three months went by and they did not do a single thing. The bully got far worse and she was just mentally tormenting me, you know, day in and day out. And now, you know, I'm still reporting it to my supervisor. I'm reporting it to HR. I'm sending all the documents and they're just ignoring me. So they're leaving me in this, this, you know, stressful environment. And again, I don't recognize it because I trust them. You know, these are six figure professionals who are sitting in an administrative office building on a college campus. I don't see them as perpetrators. I see them as workplace professionals. And that's where I went wrong. They are criminals, you know, in my opinion. They misled me. That's fraud. That's a crime. They conspired against me. It's a crime. So I, but, you know, again, not recognizing it at the time, I stayed in my toxic work environment. And I said, you can go up to, you know, like, I can kind of go through that same thing. They just kept ignoring me and stringing me along. And then I just one day, then I realized they were trying to fire me. And so I was that, that's where I went. I was like, I can't deal with this. When you found out that they were trying to fire you, what was your visceral reaction in that moment? Because I can tell you things that were said to me in confidence, conversations that I had with people who I thought were going to take care of the issue. I can tell you what I was wearing, what I was <laughs> thinking in that moment. Like you just, it, it is a trauma. I mean, you remember those touch point moments of these experiences. What went through your mind when you realized they're trying to get rid of me when I'm the one who's been asking for accountability and help and they promised me they would, but they failed me. Total disbelief. Um, I was in really a state of denial. I, re I went into this ruminating that was just so intense. I had never, ever been, but I, so I just kept playing the scenarios over and over and over in my mind. How did I, you know, how did this become about me? And I was trying so hard to figure it out. And my husband, and it was just a perfect storm of life too. We had lost power in our home and I was supposed to go to work. And, but because I did not have power, the institution opened, but my, I didn't have power here and I had lost my food and everything else. So I had shot off an email to my supervisor and said, I'm not coming in today. And that's when she shot back an email to me, you're supposed to be in this training. And that's when the light bulb went off. And I was like, man, she was setting me up. She's, you know, I, she can fire me for insubordination if I don't show up to a meeting that she called. And my, I had a personal advisor and he had given me that information. And so it was just this whole, you know, like it just kept running through my head. So for the next five days, I slept maybe five hours in total. I could not go to sleep. I could not stay asleep. I could not get my mind off of this. And, um, and I'm, you know, my husband, of course, he had been watching me spiral out of control for mm -hmm. months. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. but at this point in time, he, you know, he's 
he's beside himself because he knows I'm not sleeping. I can't, you know, I'm, you know, he would beg me to come back to bed. And I'm like, why do I, I can't sleep. I'm not, you know, just went on. And then, like I said, um, there was a couple more snow days. So I really had some time that I thought to think, but it wasn't, you know, again, just the ruminating. Yeah. And then it was time for me to go back to work. And like I said, I just got up that morning and started crying and I didn't stop. I could not stop. I couldn't control myself. I just was, you know, really, I've just have never been in such a state of, um, I felt, you know, I, I said like, I, I felt like I was a wild animal. They had put me, they had trapped me. They trapped me in a corner and okay. that's what I sounded like a wild animal. I've been there and I know that pain so very well because you're asking yourself, not just why did this happen to me, but you're trying, as you mentioned about the ruminating, but you're, you're trying to figure out what did I do? You, you begin to blame yourself and then it just comes to a point where you realize I don't deserve this. I can't take this anymore. And you just kind of walk away. I walked away without a safety net. I walked away with nothing. I just walked away because it was that pervasive and that's unconscionable. And yet there are times when I look back and go, well, could I have stuck it out a little longer? And every once in a blue moon, when I say that, my husband goes, are you kidding me? Because our families, like your husband, they feel it. They sense it. They are experiencing this along with us. How did this affect your husband and your children, your family, your friends, what were some of the side effects, if you will, that they experienced because of your experience? Well, my children are older and so they were out of the house. So they did not see, you know, per se, but my husband was, um, you know, as I said, for months on end, he kept, you know, trying to comfort me, trying to, you know, get me to leave. You know, he would be sending me job descriptions and he's like, here, you can, you know, and I'm not listening to him. I don't, I'm not even, he's like on the back burner and he's the only one trying to help me, but I don't mm -hmm. listen to him. And, um, you know, at this point in time to um, the next day after I left work, I don't know why, again, because I was so consumed at work with the abuse. The day after I left work, I bully, I, I Googled bullying. And that was the first time I ever saw that workplace bullying existed. And that's when I realized the employer culpability and bam, you know, so here I was already a wild animal screaming, not knowing what, you know, like I just had nothing left in me. And then I get this other wham. And um, so that set my husband off because now he's reading what I'm reading and he was freaking out that I was going to kill myself because that's what happens and that's what people do. And um, when they're pushed to the end like that and your, you know, your sense of safety is gone and everything is gone, you know, I'm sick, I'm unemployed, um, you know, I've been betrayed. I'm, you know, I just can't even cope with all of this. And so that was his reaction. And again, my children and outside family, um, you know, because they didn't see me every day, when I would speak to them and I love them to death and not that, you know, they meant me any harm, but I could see their eyes glaze over in disbelief with that look of, you know, that cognitive dissonance kicks in because they are saying, but what she's saying can't be true. An employer would not do this if she had to have done something. And then when you're like, you, you know, Andrea, you're, I'm already traumatized. And so now I'm being, further traumatized because I can see in their face that they think I did something. Um, so I just, I learned very quickly. I was only weeks out of the workplace when I made a decision not to talk about my abuse at all. Because, really? oh I, yeah, I couldn't, I couldn't even talk about it with my husband. Yes. And a therapist who I had worked through uh, a divorce for years before. Those were the only two places that I could talk about it. I couldn't talk oh. any place else because I would trigger and I would be, you know, out of, I, I couldn't control. I'd be crying. I'd be hysterical. Yeah. Everyone, I just, you know, all those trauma responses. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think there's something too to be said that when you share it with not just family and friends, but, you know, if you're talking about it to anyone, so many people don't 
believe us. They don't understand. Well, how was this? How, how did that happen? Why don't you just, and I've heard this from a legislator, just put your big girl panties on and keep moving. This is the way it is, mm-hmm. but it's wrong. And yet so many people, this has become the culture of not just the U S of the world, because I'm hearing from so many people all over the world, the UK, New Zealand, Australia, who are experiencing this. This is really a global emotional pandemic that we're going through. And yet no one feels as if we can change this. What I love is you decided to turn your pain into a purpose. And so here we are all of these years later after your experience and you decided, because as you mentioned before, this this is a crime. This is an assault. Something needs to be done just as like sexual abuse and sexual assault. It took a while before the country realized that that was criminal activity and those people who were abusing others needed to be held accountable. What was it within you that pushed you to the point where you turned your pain into purpose and decided something has to be done? Well, as I said, I was just in such a state of shock and you know, I, I have to say, I wanted to embrace my faith and mm. I couldn't. I, I found myself standing there saying, really, God, you're kidding me. You know, this you knew this was happening. And so I just felt betrayed from by God. <laughs> you know, I was like, I couldn't even go to my safe place. Um, mm-hmm. That's how low it was. And so I, it's like I said, I was in that same numbness and I kept saying, you let this happen to me. And I have a history of abuse. I grew up in a very unhealthy home and I was married to um, a man who emotionally abused me for 30 years. So, and then I went to work, I got a divorce and I went to work with the bully. (laughs) So I just, my whole life, I just went ba-boom, ba-boom, ba-boom. And so I couldn't deal with that. I was like, uh, I just remember saying, God, how could you let this happen to me? And about, it really, I want to say like, six weeks out of the workplace, I finally had this sense of, um, Mm. you know, the Holy Spirit just saying to me, Mm. I have 240 emails, right. And I did not even realize, I thought I had all these emails I was collecting because I was trying to convince them that the bully was doing this to me. And Mm -hmm. it took years before I discovered that I had evidence of what they did to me as well. In your own mind, personally and emotionally and even spiritually to say, okay, God, you knew this was going to happen to me, obviously. And even I still to this day, there are moments when I'm like, okay, God, I need you to show up today because I don't know if I'm going to make it because it's this roller coaster of emotions that that we, we live in, especially if you haven't found a job after the abuse. And we'll get to that in a little bit. But mm-hmm this notion of how do I turn this into something that I can help other people, but we first have to help ourselves before we're able to help other people. Um, How did you finally get to that moment? Was it after prolonged therapy? How long did it take you before you said, okay, let's do something with this to help other people? Well, right after I felt that nudge to write, I, I tried to do it. I, it, I couldn't always because I would look at be looking at these em- emails and I would get triggered. Mad. And, you know, because then you're reading them and you're saying, oh, my word, they were lying to me. And I didn't, you know, and so now you're traumatized. So I, I kind of went about it and, you know, and I'm trying to practice self-care, which I suck at. <laughs> I, I, I'm terrible. I just, I, it's because, again, my history of abuse, I am much better at taking care of other people than I am I myself. Know. So I was trying to take care of myself the best I could and, mm-hmm. you know, process this. And I had hit on, you know, when I looked for that day and I found up about workplace bullying, I had hit a link and I started getting these emails and it was about a piece of legislation here in Massachusetts. And, you know, it was about four months out and I realized that Deb Falzoy um, was the person behind those emails. Um, she, you know, I just kind of kept following that email path Mm -hmm. and she would put out these emails. Well, you know, do you want a text bank? Do you want to get organizational endorsements? And, and so about four months out, I said, you know what, I'll, I'll 
see if you know and it, like you know you always and i'm saying all right god if i see that one more time i know it's supposed That's to be true. you know and so there it comes again and i'm like all right so i contacted her and i'm like how do you know what do you want me to do and so four months deep sitting here at home in my pajamas i started mm -hmm. fighting back and I started getting organizational endorsements for this piece of legislation that she was working on. And then, um, you know, it just kept, you know, I just kept trying to, you know, to, to help where I could. And I was, again, trying to write, I'm trying to get myself better, all these things. And it just, it took a long time. I followed Deb um, to another piece of legislation and we both were on a board with this other organization. And in 2022, we both resigned and we were one, there were half the board resigned over issues that it doesn't matter now. But, um, you know, through that time, that was at that point in time in 2020, 2022, I was out of work for four years. And all along the way, as I had been, you know, and I had by that time I had testified twice at the Massachusetts State House and Rhode Island. So I, you know, I was definitely, you know, fighting back. You mentioned that you were out of work for four years. Let's talk about that before we go back to EWA. And and the reason why is because I am finding not only have I been out of a job for four years, that there is this this system of post retaliation. I believe that once people speak up, tell the company, the powers that be, that I see what you're doing, I'm taking a walk, and or they're fired because someone has spoken up, that they do everything in their power to continue to silence you, but they really want to destroy your life. I cannot tell you how many people who are struggling, who have walked away from toxic employers and, and, and coworkers, and they are suffering continually because they can't get work. Mm -hmm. And they believe as if they've been blackballed or, you know, blacklisted. They, they believe, you know, those former employers have said negative things about them, that they've told people within their industry, here's somebody to watch out for. I mean, that is the, the story of so many people. And I just can't imagine that everyone's having the same experience, but that it, Yet there are people who say, well, that doesn't happen. It does happen. Why are we not, why are companies not standing up and helping these people? Mm -hmm. Well, this, you know, all it, 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 when you pull back all the layers of this, what you are going to find is your, the, the person who is the head of the legal department mm -hmm. is, you know, they're trying to avoid liability. And so that's it. Once you are a threat of liability, you are, you're just going to, you have that tag hanging around you because every employer is going to look at you the same way. You're a threat of liability. And, you know, that, and I didn't have that experience because I, I didn't end up going back to work. Um, and again, as I said, you know, I'm an older woman. I, I had a niche job and I was sick. I could, I was so sick. I could not work. I was unable yeah. to work for the, for the first couple of years. But there was this, there's this lovely young woman at church and, you know, someone said, to her, go talk to Vicki. And so, you know, sure enough, you know, she was being bullied in the same industry. She kept going from job to job and it would all start off fine. And within, within a month, they would, you know, target her again, the exact same kind of behavior. And she ended up having to leave her field that she was, you know, had gone to school for and everything else. And she had to switch gears and go into another place where she was not known. Um, and that's, you know, how she has survived. But we do hear this all the time. You know, a matter of fact, one of the, you know, one of the people on our leadership team, you know, she just, you know, told us the same thing. I, she just was blindsided again. And that's, we, we see it, but, and, but that's what it is until we keep pulling back these layers because everyone talks about the bully, everyone talks about HR, everyone, you know, and like that was my big thing was pointing the finger at the employer. And mm -hmm. until we really look at the person behind the curtain, and that is the head of the legal department, they are the ones who are making sure that you never work again. What I am in seeing and experiencing and hearing from so many people who have, who have been in our situation or in it now, is that they, they feel as if their souls are dying because they are being prevented from living out their life's mission, their life's purpose, their life's passion, 
just because they did the right thing. Um, Who would think that doing the right thing would equate to losing your job, your livelihood, your ability to take care of yourself and your family because you did the right thing? That just, it floors me. It floors me. And, and yet we see companies who say, speak up if you hear something. If you see something, say something. I know a lot of police departments around the country say, if you see something, say something. We are we are dependent, I would believe we should be, on the truth. We should, should honor the truth. And yet when truth is being told because of this threat of liability, that becomes more important. It's the, the kind of the cog in the wheel is money. And so because they don't want to be held liable because they see this as a money situation and not a human situation, what can we do to turn this around? Because I am exhausted by hearing the stories of thousands of people who are dealing with this. I mean, I think the conversation is beginning to be had on social media like never before, but yet no one wants to do anything. We don't want to make a law. We don't. We, we can't. We can't determine and, and decide how people conduct themselves. And I'm thinking, but yes, we can. Yes, we can. That's what laws are for. Mm -hmm. what, what else can? What more can we do? Because it just feels as if sometimes, as if the, the word, even though we're talking about it, that people don't really understand it and don't want to be part of the solution because they're afraid that the people who don't believe in it, that they will then be targeted. So they're like. I'm going to stay out of it. I'm going to mm -hmm. stay out of it. Mm -hmm. This is, I, you know, I've said it often. This is the abuse that it keeps on giving. <laughs> you know, you keep getting abused and abused and abused and abused over and over and over. It does not let go. And mm -hmm. I can tell you, since I came out of work six years ago, the conversation has changed. And, mm -hmm. you know, you said you've been out four years now. So the conversation, the it, the conversation is changing and we have to keep doing what we're doing. And that is, like I said, our big, our greatest obstacle is raising public awareness and educating our legislators because our legislators are asleep at the wheel. They are so enamored with businesses. It's like give them every, give them tax breaks, give them this, give them that, everything to drive the economy. Our legislators have lost sight of the fact that there needs to be balance between an employer and an employee. They can't have a business without us and we can't, you know, we need that paycheck. So it's like that balance is yeah. so out of whack. We have more violations in the United States. I don't, I can't remember the stat off the top of my head, but I think there's like 62 other Western industrialized nations who have less than we have. And everyone talks about that we're the greatest country or we think that we are or whatever. Um, we have to keep, you know, what we're doing is the right thing. You know, raising public awareness, speaking out, giving each other, you know, if the, if you have the ability to employ someone, um, you know, this is a really unique time in this country for, you know, entrepreneurialism, you know, that kind of thing too. People are starting, especially after um, COVID, you know, people COVID, yeah. really just went into their own little niches. And so people do have, you know, some opportunity, but I know that doesn't help everybody. And it certainly, you know, didn't help me, you know, this crippled, yeah. you know, crippled me, you know, financially, I lost all my stability. I had meant to work for 10 more years. And so I live a very different life than I imagined. And, um, and you know what, it, it's okay. You know, it's not about the money. Um, but, you know, raising public awareness, just what we're doing, you know, again, I think our government too is starting to acknowledge that, you know, there's a term which, you know, I just, Deb and I just rewrote the legislation again because we are always in process learning, but the yeah. word is psychosocial hazard. And our government right now acknowledges bullying as a psychosocial hazard. Okay, wow. so OSHA, dictates that if our employer knows a known hazard, then they need to do something about it. So now if our government acknowledges this, then our legislators should certainly acknowledge this too. So it's just every day we keep building upon, you know, what, what we have, yeah. this foundation, this road um, that Deb, you know, she was at this work 10 years before I came out of work. So, you know, people like her, you know, who have been out there and have laid this road for us to walk on, we 
will continue to walk on it. It's not easy. It's not perfect. And it's not going to happen overnight. But we are moving forward. Absolutely. That's huge. Psychosocial hazard. You know, as you and Deb continue to make changes and adapt the legislation based on new information and new statistics and things that come to the forefront, what is your greatest desire? I mean, obviously, it's it's trying to pass the Workplace Psychological Safety Act. But the fact that so many people have been kind of against it, if you will, especially when we were talking to legislatures. I remember I, I was reading some information about what happened in Massachusetts, as well as in Rhode Island. And as soon as you, you know, all of this information is shared, people's stories are shared, they're so quick and immediate to say, not gonna work, not gonna work, not gonna work. And it is, it's all about protecting big businesses. How do we go about letting businesses know that this is actually a win-win for everyone? This actually helps business. This is good for business. How do we communicate that in a way, especially when businesses are all about making money, in a way that this actually increases productivity? When your people are happy, they do they do more work, sometimes just because they love where they work, because you've created a culture and an environment where they can be their authentic selves. When productivity increases by the employee, guess what happens, businesses? You make more money, and that's why you're in the business, to make money. So these, these moments of, oh, we stand for this, this is our, these are our values, and so on and so forth, it's really not, because if they were, we would not be talking about this today. How do we help businesses understand this is good for you? In the same way that we're talking to our legislators, we need to be educating businesses because they have, we have to get that legal department out of their ear, <laughs> you know, so we have work to do. So they're listening to the wrong person and that's no excuse. You know, it's no excuse for, you know, human avoiding human well-being and not even just avoiding human well-being or prioritizing liability mm -hmm. over human well-being, but abusing, okay. um, um, abusing your people. And that's the thing too. I don't think, um, some of them, I, I think they don't realize the detrimental effects. You know, they just, they, some of them really, honestly, I think they just think, well, the person goes out the door. So that's all they know. And then they never hear that other part of it. So it is, it's just as much, you know, education is the single most important thing that we can do for everyone. And, you know, CEOs, um, you know, human resource departments, there's a lot of people in human resources who have left human resources because of this. We need those same people to come back and to stand up and to expose, help us, you know, stand with us, you know, and expose these practices that are, you know, destroying people's lives to the point where, um, you know, there's loss of life. That is on the spectrum here. So what, you know, where do we yeah. begin? It's just, like I said, it's, it's yeah. all in process. In part two, we talk more about the WPSA and how Vicky now thrives in life. Thank you so much for watching, subscribing, and sharing this YouTube channel.